Story time. I have only spoken to a few close friends about this experience, and my parents don't quite believe me. When I was about 12 years old, my two younger brothers, my two younger cousins, and I were playing outside at night. Our cousins had come over to visit us, and all the adults were inside the house. At the time, we lived in a small trailer park in Texas, which was built either on top of or near indigenous land. We played outside a lot, and there was a street light that shone over the part of the road where we were playing, so it didn't feel too creepy. I looked down the road, where a white house sat. Next to it was a garage, and next to that was the forest there was a lot of forest in the area. I saw something coming out of the forest. I thought it was a wolf for a brief moment, but then my heart sank when I saw its distorted, long, thin limbs, and the uncanny way it moved, which brought tears to my eyes. It had a long head, and a small mouth, like a horse, was tan in color, extremely thin, and had no tail. I grabbed my cousins and told them to look where I was pointing, asking if they could see it too, or if I was crazy. They had terrified looks on their faces and said, yes. I looked back at the creature and saw it get up and start walking on its two hind legs, moving in such a freaky way. It began to climb the garage with ease. This thing had to have been around 8-10 feet tall, while standing on its back legs. I then ordered everyone to run inside. I told the adults what we saw, but they didn't believe us for whatever reason. I assume they thought it was our imaginations. Anyway, I haven't seen those cousins since the encounter due to family issues. I have searched the internet many times trying to find a sighting report or image that resembles this creature, but I have had no luck. So now I am turning to Reddit. Please let me know if you know anything about what we saw that night, or if you have seen something like it. Long story short. I had an experience involving a very aggressive dog, running past me with its tail between its legs at Mach 3. My poor quality flashlight showed me normal deer walking around, and something about 8 feet tall walking with them on two legs, with deer antlers and face. That place has always given me the creeps, and I'm not a wuss or a pushover. I was a volunteer fireman for over a decade, running into burning buildings for fun. I always loved the woods and outdoors born and raised in northeast Georgia, but that holler has always given me the creeps. After that night, never again. Ever. For what it's worth, that encounter turned me into a flashlight enthusiast. I now have way more money invested in them than is reasonable, and it's the entire reason I bought an Asibian K75. If I can't kill it, I can at least blind it and hopefully get away. We've had plenty of pets go missing down there permanently, including a squat little wiener dog mix. When we finally found him, he was 15 feet up a tree on a limb, whining for days. Jesus Christ, I hate that holler. I could tell plenty of stories about that place, and we've only lived here for about 5 years. When you look from above, there are only maybe 100 yards to a fence line to the next guy's property. But when you're actually in it, it feels like it warps your perception. It took us 20 minutes just to get halfway to that fence. That was the time we had to go look for RJ, the little idiot dog, because I swore for days I heard him whining, but could never see him. When my upstairs neighbor owner of RJ, and I finally went to look, it took us an hour to cover what's basically about an acre of basic woods, not super thick, and not hard to traverse. When we got to where I was positive I could hear him right next to me, we couldn't find him for the longest time. He ended up being above me in a tree. That dog could barely jump on the couch, so I have no idea how he ended up that far up a tree. It's not like he could climb. Noah my upstairs neighbor had to physically climb the tree and drop him down to me. Both of us decided never to go in there again. So much weird juju in there. I have two incidents. When I was about 12, me and a load of kids from the neighborhood went to paddle in a lake. It's in the countryside, outside our village. I looked to my left and saw a woman standing on the surface of the lake, 
about 20 feet away. The water there was about 3 or 4 feet deep, cause I checked afterwards. She was dressed in long white robes, which covered her hair too. These robes were gleaming white. She was patting her face with some sort of cloth, as though she was crying. She was as real and solid as you and me, not see-through or anything. In extreme shock, I looked away, and when I looked back a second later, she was gone. It turned out that one other girl saw her too. No idea what she was, why she was dressed like that, why she appeared to be crying, or how she could have been standing on the surface of three feet deep water. My other one. Three years later, I was passing a wooded garden, half a mile from my house. It was the priest's house, very old, and in a quiet area, no other houses nearby. About ten feet away from me, a figure was hanging from a tree. It was a male figure, and had his back to me. He was right in against the tree trunk, with his arms suspended by his sides. Either he had no head, or his head was out of sight. He wore all grey clothes, as though they were from the 70s or 80s. Grey trainers, grey work and school uniform trousers, a puffy grey jacket. Again, it was a solid apparition, as real as you and me. I stared at it for literally minutes, taking in every detail. It wasn't a trick of the light or anything. There was no apparent way for him to be hanging there no visible rope, or anything. And the fact that I couldn't see any head was really creepy. I ran all the way home and burst into tears. My mom believed me. But there were definitely no acts of self unaliving in the area. It's a teeny rural village in Ireland, and everyone knows everyone. There have been only two acts of unaliving there ever, and they are still talked about. No idea what the hell it was I saw. So I'm pretty sure there is a skinwalker in my small town in Texas. It seems to take on the forms of cats and a buck. I only say I'm pretty sure because not only have I seen it, but almost all my neighbors in my complex have seen it too, as well as my sister's boyfriend, who is highly skeptical. My sister and her boyfriend have seen it multiple times. Once, he even chased it across the parking lot after seeing it in cat form, sitting under my next door neighbor's toddler's bedroom window. He said it ran off around a neighbor's car, and when he went to the opposite side of the car, he saw it shift into a humanoid form, and run off past the apartments. On top of all that, at night it sounds like someone is trying to get into the house when no one is out there. I 20 female have seen this thing following me around since I was a kid. When I've been in a moving car, it doesn't matter where I'm sitting, I can see it moving in the tree lines, following my car. When I'm walking outside, I can see it at a distance walking behind me. To describe this thing, I can only say it looks like Slenderman, but way taller and bulkier, with extremely long arms and legs. It doesn't have a face either. I am the only person who can see it no matter whom I've asked. Also, when I first started seeing this thing, I didn't know who Slenderman or anything like that was. I'm not from Texas, but this happened in Northeast Alabama. The area is part of the Trail of Tears thousands of Native Americans being displaced. Anyways, me and a buddy were driving to a friend's house right around 2 a.m. in the morning, we were teenagers. We pull up to a stop sign and my buddy's lights are shining across the road into a field. Now, I don't know if you ever watched the 2003 Hulk movie, but bear with me. There was this tall hairy Bigfoot looking, honestly creature with long limbs standing on two legs. Its back was to us, but as soon as we pulled to the stop sign and lights were on him. He started leaping. Like huge jumps across this field until he was out of sight in the darkness. It made me think of how the Hulk leaps in that movie lol. My buddy looked at me and said, now. Tell me you seen that. And I definitely agreed. We got the hell out of there. We always figured Bigfoot was the best description. It was super tall. Not a bear, and definitely not a deer.
I've told this story before and my children say I should write it all down. I'm going to leave that up to them to do. I've written it on several YouTube sites, and at first it was cathartic for me. I hadn't talked about it for about 50 years, because it was strictly forbidden to be discussed by the grandparents and folks. It was the big family secret that we didn't want anyone to know, and then label us as cracked pots. Anyway over 50 years ago, I saw three werewolves or dogmen. They were in a field eating something big and bloody. They followed me back to the farm, and I am sure they would have eaten me too if they hadn't just eaten. That's all I'm going to say. I am tired of being called a liar and a delusional idiot. It happened, and it was terrifying. It was on an old family farm almost right smack dab center of Missouri. In the foothills of the Ozarks, a bit south. It used to be about 2500 acres, but now some has been sold so it's down to about 800. I could ride my horse all day and never leave the farm. I used to work responding to emergency calls doing trauma scene, fire damage cleanup among other catastrophes that happened to buildings. Been to homicide, unattended deaths, structure fires that resulted in deaths. Pretty much you name it I've seen it, and my crews clean up the aftermath of it. About 15 years ago, responding to a house fire that was known that either a grandma or grandfather died trying to save grandkid. They both died in the fire as they couldn't make it out before becoming overwhelmed with smoke. The parents survived and I think an older sibling did as well. Very sad situation, and I've always hated knowing before having access to the property. By the time the property was released to my crew to secure and board up the structure it was already 10 pm. There were several windows and doors that needed to be boarded up, and since it was a two-story home we had a bit of work ahead of us. We had one crew member outside working on cleaning up broken glass and stacking any debris that needed to remain on site. There were three working inside boarding up and securing the building. We knew where the bodies were found and I guess because of that we just saved that room for last. Now whenever you enter a building that has suffered extreme heat of fire, and then being doused by water and broken up by firemen trying to look for smoldering spots you know, and you expect to hear strange noises, thuds and creaks. Also since the power is shut off you are in there with big battery powered lanterns and floodlights outside from the trucks. What started to happen was first we heard talking, it sounded like news from TV, we found the source, and it was an alarm clock radio that had gone off in what we assumed was the grandparents room, now we assume it was a malfunction due to the fire, and that it was battery powered, so we shut it off and continued on. Later one of the crew members yelled WTF. We walked over to him, and he said that he saw a shadow walk across the room he was working in, he was alone in the room. Yes we made fun of him. Then we heard a crash, it came from the baby's room we walked over and found that what had looked like a shelf unit full of toys and stuff had fallen over. That was odd because the room wasn't what you would call severely damaged by the fire. But then you know with the heat and all you expect things to become warped and unsteady. Lastly the home had an intercom system, there was one in the hallway, master bedroom and kitchen. I swear there was some kind of static coming from it intermittently almost like someone was hitting the call button on it. Keep in mind that the power was off, and we didn't have any radio equipment that would have caused some kind of interference. To my knowledge the older systems did not have a battery backup either. We eventually agreed that the three crew members would finish the work in the baby's room together, and by this time we were all a little freaked up so we got out of that house ASAP. I'm an atheist. I do not believe in any paranormal activities, but I had evidence of their existence in my hands when I was 10 years old. I wasn't aware of the importance of proof, and I used to believe in God back then. This happened in the north of Iran, Tabaristan. The forest between the mountain and the Caspian Sea have always been known to be a home for creatures called Jinn, Deev, and Peri, also known as fairies in Western culture which I absolutely don't believe. My aunt and her family went to a vacation in the north, 
She just bought a new phone that can record video. It was a new thing back then so she kept recording everything they did in that trip. When they come back home and rewatch the videos, they all quickly notice something strange in one of the videos. They rent a house that is next to the forest, the last one. In north of Iran, because of farming rice, houses are not built next to each other in some areas. They made a campfire next to the forest, they use coals for kebab, then head back to serve in the house because of flies annoyance and bugs. But they left the fire alone, because they wanted to come back and sit next to it after eating. When they are eating, my aunt is recording them, and the house and explains the vibes. She then shows the fire through the windows, and then zooms on it, then explains that. We made fire here for kebab, big fire as you can see, like she is recording to show her friends. After the vacation when they are re-watching the videos, they quickly notice something strange in the part where she zooms on the fire. There are at least three blurry human figures around the fire, they move around the fire, and then jump over it, as if they are dancing with the fire. The way they behave to fire, is actually a famous tradition that Iranians do in the Scarlet Day festival. We make fire on the last Wednesday of the year to celebrate fire for some ancient religious reasons. After the influence of Islam on Iran, people pretty much call everything supernatural the jinn, because its existence can cover anything. Because they can take any form. So everyone pretty much agreed that these are jinns, and they made some prayers and more special prayers, and said it's not good to talk about them. I personally watched the video on my aunt's phone like 20 times, I was mesmerized by that. I didn't have a phone back then, so when I grow up and understood how important that video was my aunt's phone was long gone. I've been searching for that video for 5 years now. First, I wasn't even trying to look for the video because I knew it would be impossible. But when I ended up in the north of Iran for university, I met so many locals. I've heard so many similar stories, most of them are fogged with myth and extractions. One day when I told this story to some of my local friends, and they quickly recognized it, and they said they have already seen that video. I thought they are lying, but they finished my story before I even tell them what the figures were doing, they already knew it. I was blown away. Turns out my aunt shared that video with some locals because they were excited that they caught gins on camera. Over the years, that video was shared in the chain of Bluetooth sharings, and many people have seen it back then. So I started asking people if they remember such a clip, and found three more non-related individuals who have seen it. I tried searching the internet, deep web, dark web, any web you say, and have not found it. If you happen to have this video or anything similar to this, DM me an urge. I have two hypotheses. Old phones are not good at rendering fire which is also zoomed in, the heat from the flames appears as a blur, but the display shows it as pixels and colors, and some random interaction of wind and the flames made some optical illusions. Also, my memories are distorted, I can't be sure what I'm remembering is really the real video. You can't remember videos very vividly, try remembering a scene from the Titanic movie, how accurate do you think your imagination is? B. There are some semi-invisible creatures who live in the forest. They appear to be smart based on that video, because they are mimicking what humans do in that area. If they have developed this much of advanced stealth features through evolution, they are probably very vulnerable. If you are smart, and you know your vulnerability, you would definitely avoid humans. Because they are the dominant ones. That's why they live in the deep forests. We do not know anything else about them. Seems like they are incapable of making fire, but they like it, or maybe they are trying to put it down to save their habitat. Maybe they thought humans have left a fire next to the forest, they know the danger because it happens almost every year in the north of Iran. Many parts have burned before. If they live in the woods, then fire is a very stressful thing for them. I was over my aunt's house one day when I was about 5 years old, playing alone in the sandbox in her backyard. Someone from inside called me, saying dinner was ready. I turned to say okay, I'll be right in. When I turned back around, 
There was a weird, bipedal insect looking thing standing on the wooden edge of the sandbox, looking at me. I just stared at it for a moment, and it didn't move. It was completely black and quite shiny like most of its exoskeleton and body was made of chitin. Maybe a foot tall and very squat, so about 8-10 inches wide. Its head made up about half of its height. It had very large eyes, much like a fly's. It had antennae on its head, but they were very small. It may also have had wings, but from I only got a good look at it from the front. I went over to it, and it didn't move or back away, it just kept staring at me. Someone called me from inside the house again, and when I looked back at it, it was gone. I'm almost positive I'm just misremembering a dream or something, but it's an extremely vivid memory. I haven't really mentioned it to anyone. But I have looked online to see if I could find anything similar without any luck. This summer, my family had a reunion for my grandma's birthday in Est Park, and we decided to stay at the Stanley Hotel. Obviously, I had seen The Shining and heard stories, but I didn't think much about the possibility of a ghost encounter. I went into it thinking that if there were ghosts, and I didn't bother them or think about them, they wouldn't bother me, wrong. On our first night at the Stanley, I stopped by the lodge, which is part of the historical Stanley Hotel, but has been rebuilt. I was with my cousin and her boyfriend in the main area by the staircase, waiting to meet my mom because she had left her purse at another cabin a few miles down the road, where some other family members were staying. It was maybe 11.30 pm, so there wasn't anyone in sight inside the lodge. The main building is where guests check in, and there are people there all the time, just like a normal hotel but the lodge had the doors open with just a few lights on and nobody around. I thought it was kind of creepy at first that there was literally no one, but I figured it wasn't a high traffic area and that people were in their rooms for the night. We started to walk around and wanted to see a little more of the place before my mom got there. I was joking around, standing under the chandelier and started saying, hey, Mr. Stanley and stupid stuff like that. My cousin joined in and we started laughing and headed to check out one of the side rooms. At the lodge, there are two big rooms off of the main area. One is a dining room, and the other is a living room. By this time, we had calmed down and were just looking around as we headed toward the side living room. My cousin and I were walking next to each other, and her boyfriend was checking out a painting about 20 feet away from us, next to the entrance to the living room. As we were walking up, I thought it was a little weird that the lights were dimmed and everything seemed to be shut down for the night, but the doors were open. The doors to the dining room however, were shut. This aspect wasn't that creepy, it's just what crossed my mind as we were walking towards the room. Visually, my first glimpse of the room, along with the bad energy coming from it, made me hesitate at the door. As I stepped forward to proceed into the room, I felt strong pressure on my upper diaphragm, like I had been pushed. I immediately turned around and started walking away. I didn't want to say anything about it because we had just been joking around about ghosts, and I didn't want to seem dramatic plus, it was a little too ironic. But as I was walking away, I realized my cousin had turned around and was walking away from the room just as fast as I was. My eyes started watering like I had gotten the wind knocked out of me, and we stopped and looked at each other. Her eyes were watering too. I gave her a confused look and pointed to my upper diaphragm, and she just nodded, yes. We were both super freaked out, and now standing back under the chandelier. Meanwhile, her boyfriend had just seen us walk towards the living room, hesitate, then basically run away from the room, and proceed to freak out, all in maybe 30 seconds. Now his reaction was the thing that scared me the most because he started walking towards us and immediately asked what the lady had said to us. But here's the thing. Neither my cousin nor I saw anyone in the room. Her boyfriend said he saw a lady through the glass door wave her hands as though to shoo us out of the room, which is why he thought we left so abruptly. My cousin and I immediately told him that there wasn't anyone in there. Needless to say, we noped out of there and I ended up staying at the cabin down the road. As we walked out the front door, 
My dad walked up, and we handed the purse to him and just left. Anyways, for those who have had creepier experiences, this probably seems pretty insignificant, but there's something about the confirmation of the paranormal that has changed the way I look at things. I still don't seek out ghosts or go to scary dark places for fun, but I do have a respect now, knowing that they're there. My dad told me a story about a decade ago, about something that had happened to him, sometime in the late 70s. He had recently bought a restored Corvette Stingray from a man for a very low price. The car was in perfect shape, and was surprised to see it being sold for well under its market value. The owner had been in an accident in which his passenger had been killed after a fire broke out and trapped the passenger. The owner claimed he wanted to get rid of it as it had too many bad memories, and he refused to drive it. My dad was driving the Corvette through Frazier Valley in British Columbia late at night, I think and fishtailed the back end while going around a bend. He collided with another vehicle, and the car immediately caught on fire. My dad rushed to get out of the car, and before he got out the door he heard a voice of a terrified man saying, please don't leave me, I don't want to die. Obviously my dad freaked out and bolted out the car. He watched the car slowly begin to burn, and made his way to the other vehicle to make sure they were okay, which they were. He flagged down a passing vehicle, and asked them to go to the nearest town and get the police and firefighters. The other driver and my dad stood on the side of the road, and watched the Corvette burn while they waited for help. Once the fire started the rage, a loud shrieking came from the burning wreck that lasted several minutes. The other driver asked my dad if there was someone in the car, and said, Jesus, he sounds like he is burning alive in there. My dad immediately remembered the passenger who was killed in the previous wreck, and was absolutely stunned. The Corvette didn't have a radio, so he knew that there was no explanation for the shrieking coming from inside the car. My dad apparently had nightmares for many years afterwards in which a faceless man was burning alive in the car and couldn't get out. It seriously bothered him that he had no explanation for what happened, and often wondered if he had heard the passenger who had died previously. He ended up restoring the Corvette, but refused to drive it again. He sold it at a low price shortly after I was born. My dad was the most honest man I have ever met, and to see him go pale every time he mentioned this event made me believe him, even more despite how unreal it sounded. One of my best friend's family is heavily involved with the Catholic Church. He tells me a couple really eerie stories one of which he experienced himself, the other which happened to a young priest. Keep in mind I'm recounting these stories as they were told to me years ago, by my friend. I may have forgotten a few details. When the priest from their parish relocated to a parish in Lucan, Ontario he volunteered to help him take his stuff and get settled in. The house he relocated to was actually on the property where the Black Donnellys lived. Apparently part of the original foundation still exists under the new house. So my friend brought a load of the priest's belongings, along with the priest's dog, and was supposed to stay for a couple days until the priest arrived. When my friend arrived at the house he got the welcome speech from the secretary who worked there, which included details about activity that plagued the house such as mysterious noises, a woman who could be seen looking out towards the road from the attic, and a rocking chair that rocked by itself, and couldn't be moved without ending up in the same spot again. My friend took it with a grain of salt, but tested out moving the rocking chair after the staff left for the day, only to find it later back where it was. I would have, noped the F out of there, right then. Later that evening he drove to get some groceries, he says around 10 or 11 p.m., he popped a frozen pizza into the oven and sat in the kitchen with the dog, when all of a sudden the dog ran up the stairs to the attic and stood at the top, barking into the pitch black. He went up the stairs to retrieve the dog and returned to the kitchen. A few moments later he heard footsteps coming down the stairs, which were directly beside the kitchen. He instinctively counted the footsteps, 22. 
Then the dog ran back up the stairs to the same spot, ferociously barking into the darkness again. He says he grabbed a kitchen knife, and as he went back up the stairs to get the dog, he counted the stairs, 22. That's when he took the dog and left the house and phoned the priest, explaining why he wouldn't be staying. I have no idea how long the priest stayed there, or if he had similar encounters. 2. A young priest who had just graduated from theology school was kind of working as an understudy at the parish my friend's family were part of. He was working late one night in the office when he got a frantic call from a woman who was speaking unintelligibly, something about her baby. One of the jobs of the priest were to act as counselors, so they often made house calls when they get distressed calls. So the priest assured the woman he was on his way, and would talk to her when he got there. I forget where this was, but I want to say it was around London, Ontario. He arrives, knocks on the door, and the woman answers looking clearly frazzled hair all over the place, pale and noticeably terrified. I believe she was trying to convey something about her child, yelling, my baby, my baby. But there was no child there. Whatever it was, the priest determined that he wasn't experienced enough to deal with it, and told the woman he'd return the next day with the more experienced priest. And so he did. But this time there was no answer. A neighbor came out and asked them who they were looking for, and they said the name of the woman, and told the guy that one of them had just been there the day before, and the puzzled neighbor advised them that the woman was killed, and hadn't lived there in over a decade. The following events happened when I was around five years of age. The stories that I am sharing are partially from my own recollection, and partially conveyed to me by my father and older sibling. I went to visit my father for a weekend as I did every other weekend ever since I could remember. I got told that this weekend we would be staying somewhere else to help house sit for a family that was out of town, which excited me. Upon arriving at the house, it was quite apparent that the house was quite old, and somewhat run down from being lived in for many, many years. There were numerous events that took place throughout the weekend that my family and I had stayed in the house which could not be described by anything except for the paranormal. The first event that took place was as soon as we walked into the house. There was a dead frog on the floor which is unsettling in hindsight, and somewhat foreshadowing for the events that were about to take place, but we didn't pay much attention to the cynical aspect of it, more so making a joke about it in high hopes for an amazing weekend away from the city. The second event took place the night of our arrival once everyone was in bed, supposedly sleeping. My sister was playing with an Ouija board which I believe was the first mistake and her friend talking to a ghost, the board had shared with her that the boy was 16 years old when he had died, and in the military, and that his name was, let's say Fred for fear of repercussions of using actual names. While the sister and her friend were communicating with Fred, she couldn't believe that my father was letting me, and another child my age run around the house at such a late hour. Running up and down the stairs, talking, laughing and banging around in the room next to hers. The house had hardwood floors which made it very apparent when people were walking around, especially up the creaky stairs. The board then started repeatedly saying door, and the arrow was pointing in a direction outside of the room. When my sister went to see what it was pointing at, there was a door at the end of the hallway that led onto an old balcony that was no longer safe to stand on due to the structural integrity being compromised by age. This door was nailed shut and would not open when my sister tried to force it open. When it was time for breakfast in the morning, my sister came down to have my father scold her for staying up too late and making so much noise. When she had stated that her and her friend were quietly playing board games, and that she suspected it was my and my friend making all the noise. My father replied stating that my friend and I were sleeping in the room next to him, and were asleep quite early not making noise, this is when we start to suspect that the house has something going on beyond what we see with our eyes. The next event was during that Saturday when my father was rummaging around in one of the empty bedrooms, exploring all the house's gems from previous residents. The room had a dresser, a closet and a door that swung into the room remember this. 
While checking out the room, he had been notified by his significant other that we had run the well dry, and that we needed to go into town for some water in case, we didn't get the well back running again. Before leaving town, we headed into the basement where the well was and checked to make sure that the pump was still working properly, and to see if there was water in the bottom of the well. While in the basement, we decided to check out the crawl space which had old mementos from the past. Old photo albums which contained quite graphic and disturbing content such as black and white photos of children of Asian descent, holding up dead chickens with their heads cut off seeming to be trophies for them of some sort. The most disturbing part was seeing a framed picture on the wall of the basement of a young man in his military uniform and label below the photo that read, Fred. When we went into town to get the water, we had stated that we were staying in this old house, and the cashier seemed to be quite familiar with the house having driven past it to work every morning and evening. She seemed to be unsettled about this house in particular, warning us that there was something strange about it. On several occasions she had driven past the house and seen people standing on the balcony, but then blinked and realized that there was no one there and her eyes must have been playing tricks on her. When we arrived back at the house my father had decided to go back and check out the room that he got interrupted in. When he tried to open the door, it seemed to be jammed, but he hadn't closed it as far as he could recall. When he put some force into the door and made it open, he realized that the dresser had been pushed up against the back of the door in a way that prevented it from being opened. The dresser's contents were strewn all over the room, but the window was not open and being on the second floor, it was hard to imagine how someone could press the dresser against the back of the door and then get out of the room. This was the last event that I recall in the house, and we had left, but my father's significant other and her child were still obligated to be in the house for the pre-negotiated duration of her house sitting. The next morning we had gotten a call from her in a panic. The door that had led to the balcony was wide open with the hardware thrown on the floor that was previously holding it shut. This is all that I know about this house and once again, this is a combination of my recollections and the stories that I have been told by my family. My experience with a black-eyed woman happened in mid-December 2014. I was living in downtown Phoenix at the time and just moved into my apartment the previous month. I was out with some friends that night and got home around 10 pm i had to be at work at 5 am so i went straight to bed i woke up abruptly to knocking on my door and thought it's 2 am who the hell is at my door i laid my head back down but then i heard knocking again i peeked out my window to see who it was and it was a young hispanic woman who was very pale she yelled i need your help I immediately sprung out of bed thinking this girl was in trouble. I instantly thought if my sister or mom, if they were in that position I hope someone would help. I cracked the door open and asked, are you okay, what's wrong, she said, I need to use your phone. Her voice was very calm but something was just wrong. She was about 5 feet 8 inches, 18 20 years old or so. Everything about her seemed normal but she had these strange glasses on and a strange vibe. I told her, hold on let me grab it. I went back into my room to grab my phone when I heard the door slowly open. I quickly began to have second thoughts about what I just did opening the door to a stranger that early. I walked back out to give her my phone when I saw her lying on my couch. I told her, make it quick I need to be at work in a few hours. As I said that she turned her head towards me, took of her glasses and smiled. I couldn't move. Her eyes were completely black like someone sharpied her eyeballs and had some type of black substance in her teeth. She stood up and eased her way towards me. I tossed her the phone not wanting to be anywhere near this person. She grabbed it and made two calls, which later I found out were disconnected numbers. When she was done I asked her, can you wait outside for your ride? I need to sleep. She replied, I can't leave. I said you need to wait outside you can't be in here. She began to cry. I told her I'm sorry for whatever happened to you, but you really can't be in here. She looked up at me, smiled and asked, can I use your bathroom before I leave? 
I pointed to the bathroom, and she went into it without closing the door. I grabbed my phone from the coffee table and dialed 911, but it didn't go through. I yelled, you need to leave now, I heard nothing from her. I peeked into the bathroom, and what I saw will haunt me forever. She was scratching at her face and smiling in the mirror. I saw that and ran to my room and locked the door. I kept yelling, I called the police, I heard her giggle and say, I told you I can't leave, I wanted to cry, I was shaking and didn't know what to do. I kept telling myself, I'm strong, I'm strong. About five minutes went by and I heard knocking on the door again, as if the situation was in replay. I peeked out my window to see if it was a concerned neighbor, but it was her again. I sprinted to my door to lock it, but it already was. I was paralyzed in fear. How could she lock my door from the inside and be out? I cracked my window open and threw out a sweatshirt with 20 bucks in it. I yelled, get a cab, hitch a ride just leave me alone. She didn't touch the sweatshirt or the money and sat there on my steps as if she were waiting for me. I began pounding the connecting wall to my neighbor. I dialed 911 again and it finally went through. As I explained the situation to the dispatcher I peeked out the window to see her gone along with my sweatshirt. I felt the biggest relief. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the morning. As I left for work I opened my door to see my $20 bill on my doorstep. It looked like a brand new crisp $20 bill. I picked it up, ran to my car, and left for work. I'm not exactly sure what I experienced that night, but I will never forget it. This happened to my older brother, who we can call Danny. It was back in the early 2000s, and he was a senior in high school in a small podunk Utah town. Being a senior and a football player, he was kind of an idiot and did stupid things, one of which included walking through the woods late at night to, as he called it, throw rocks and terrorize kids from school. Yes, immature I know, but he and his accomplice another Navajo called Joe, were seniors, and on the football team. They walked through the woods because cops patrolled the streets, and there was a city curfew in place. The route they took went through a state park which has lots of Navajo artifacts, and even a kiva which you can go down into. So one night they were sneaking through the forest before the sun had risen, and they had begun to stop and shush each other, because they could sometimes hear footsteps in the distance. Unless some other geniuses had the idea to walk through the desert, there should have been no one else out there. This continued for a while, until Joe stopped Danny, grabbed him, and said, get down. They dropped to their stomachs and hid, listening. Now the footsteps, crunching through the dry desert foliage, were accompanied by mumbling. Danny estimated that the sounds were maybe 100 feet away at first, but got closer. He doesn't know if the mutterings were Navajo or English or some other language. After a while of the noises staying fairly far away, Joe whispered without looking, it sounds like a drunk. After several more minutes, Danny decided to chance a peek, as the drunk sounded more distant now. It was night, but the moon was bright and the light bounced off the canyon wall nearby. Danny was looking for a man, but instead, he saw a figure which he said, moved with a tilt to its body, and was, long and tall. It was human formed, and walking on two feet, but misshapen and very tall. He said it maybe resembled a cockapelli or Navajo Kachina doll, so not exactly normal shaped. It mumbled and drifted through the trees seemingly looking for something. He was pretty captivated, watching it for a few minutes, and then suddenly the snapping twigs and the mutterings just stopped. Everything was quiet, and the figure, whatever it was, had just disappeared. After that, Danny and Joe both felt that whatever was in the forest at the time was gone. They sat on the ground afterward discussing what had just happened. Joe asked about what Danny had seen, and then stated, I didn't look because if I would have it would have known we were both staring. When I was younger, my family went camping a lot. We used to go into the Uinta Mountains in Utah most of the time. There was a lake we were camping next to, 
So of course my family was fishing. My dad and mom, my uncle and I were on the shore, trying to catch fish. Across the shore, on the other side of the small lake, my dad noticed a huge black-haired figure, just standing still and looking right at us. It had to have been eight plus feet tall, maybe even taller since it was so far away. My dad tried yelling at it since he had thought it was a prank of some sort. I don't remember what my dad said, but I remember the sound the creature made back. It wasn't anything we understood, just a kind of unintelligible screeching. It did however sound like it knew what my dad was saying. Like it was saying something to us, only in its language. We were all looking at it at that point. My grandparents and my brother had joined us. I remember my parents attempted to recreate the screeches it was making, and it would respond. This went on for just a couple of minutes. Then the creature took off. And I mean quickly and fast, on hands and feet. The entire time before it had been on two feet, like a human. It turned and started running towards the forest, and was out of sight in seconds. It had to have been running like 25-30 miles per hour. My brother, grandpa, and dog tried chasing it, and went to where we had seen it, and in the direction it left. They did find a huge lump of black hair that was stuck in a barbed wire fence. Although I'm not certain it was really from the creature. Why we didn't leave, still puzzles me. We spent the night in tents. It was very windy, and I don't think anyone actually slept. I was worried that this creature might come around our campsite. I'm not sure the rest of my family was concerned. I think about it from time to time, but it honestly isn't that rare of an encounter in Utah. I've seen UFOs, my brother was followed by a UFO, and I lived near Skinwalker Ranch my whole life. Because of our native Ute tradition, I believe many of my people take these encounters in stride. I have a story that happened to me while I was driving along one of the really dark highways in Nevada. I was leaving Las Vegas to go camping for a few days. It was around 1 am, and I was driving down State Highway 159 just past Red Rock Canyon, the really beautiful mountainous terrain just outside Nevada. At 1 am there's really nobody else on the road. I happened to be driving down it because I was trying to make up time to make it to my campsite that morning as I had spent a bit too much time in Las Vegas at some of the shows if you catch my drift. Now you also have to realize that there are no street lights. No light other than the moon and your headlights. That's it. And there are wild horses in the area. Now I was doing under or around 60 miles per hour trying to make up time. As I'm driving, I catch movement out of the corner of my eye on the passenger side. It's a two lane road so there's no way another car would be driving beside me. I glance over and I see a black figure like some kind of giant cat, but only all black. No fur. Just like a giant black shadow as tall as my car, running alongside the car. As I glance, I get this overwhelming feeling of fear and dread, and something in my head keeps telling me, that if you keep looking at it, it's going to look back and attack you. So, I quickly look straight forward and went a bit faster, and even at 70 miles per hour, it kept up with me for several seconds before it simply vanished. My friends all told me that maybe I was looking at the car's shadow, now car shadows don't have running motion like a giant animal, and I'm not aware of any animal that can run that fast either. I believe it was some kind of spectral cat, personally. I spoke with a friend who lives in Las Vegas, and he told me people see all kinds of things in more preserved areas of Nevada. Native Americans who live in the area say such things are shape-shifting creatures, skin walkers, and the overwhelming feeling of dread, I felt was a sure sign. And if I stopped the car or kept looking at it, the thing would probably have tried to knock the car off the road and get to me. I grew up in southeast Texas about 40 miles west of Houston, and lived on a small farm. Sometimes at night, there would be something screaming out in the fields from time to time. My neighbors heard it as well. One morning while waiting for the school bus at the end of our driveway I looked down and noticed a very large barefoot print in the sand. The heel had been run over by my dad going to work, 
but the rest of it was plain as day. About 12 inches long, and at least 7 inches wide was still exposed that you could see. I knew it was a Sasquatch print. I wanted to show someone but here comes the bus, and I had no time to run back home, and get my brother to take a look. That afternoon when I got off of the bus to see the track again, so many cars went in and out of the driveway that day that it was now completely gone. I was sure disappointed about that. I tried to tell my brothers and a few friends about it, but they really did not believe me. There was a neighbor in the 1970s who lived on the property directly north of ours. He went deer hunting, shot one then took it home. He tied up the deer to field dress it, hanging from a tree limb. His wife called him in for breakfast, and after he came out to field dress the deer he looked, and saw the deer he tied up was not there. He noticed it being drug over a fence and into the woods, but he never saw what had it. Everyone said it was a big cat that got it. But looking back now, I know that big cats pick up their prey with their teeth and walk forward. This deer was being dragged. Cats do not drag anything backward. And how would a cougar be able to pull the deer down from the rope it was tied up with? If it was a cat that got the man's deer, the big cat would have been the last thing he saw going over the fence and into the woods, not the deer. Anyway, I was talking recently to a friend of mine who grew up next door to me. He is in his 50s now and I am in my mid-40s. He told me he went fishing in the 1990s on the lake that was on the property where the man had his deer drug off. He said while he was walking up to the lake in the woods that he saw trees that had the bark stripped off of them about 9 feet off of the ground, and it looked like there were claw marks on the bark as well. While he was fishing there that day he began to get the feeling of being watched. That made him feel nervous, but then he noticed a very strong musky odor that he never smelled before, and he got the heck out of there fast. He said when he goes to visit his parents' place, he can still smell that smell from time to time in the air. He also said he and his brothers would hear whistling and whoops on their property, but never saw what was making the noise. He said they also heard stuff walking on two feet on their property at night, but never saw anything either. Another incident in the exact same area in the 1960s where some guys went swimming at their lake one evening. It was about quarter mile from my home. While two brothers and a couple of friends were swimming, their car horns started blowing. There were no houses close by, and they thought that my uncle was over there messing with them. They got kind of spooked because they could not see their car since it had become dark. So they got out of the lake, grabbed their flashlights, and ran over there to where the car was parked. They told me that there were very large footprints all in the sand around their car. They knew then it was not my uncle messing with them, because the prints were so large, it would have had to be an extremely large person to have left it. But nothing was ever said about a Sasquatch. They just thought it was some large man without shoes on. One more thing that happened to my older brother, and cousin makes me think it too was also a Sasquatch. My mother had a twin sister, and they were always doing stuff together. So one evening, there was a special at church and my parents and my aunt and uncle went to it. My older brother and cousin stayed at my aunt's house, while the grown-ups were all at church. Long story short my aunt and uncle had a cattle farm. And they had dogs that were kind of mean per se, but did not take a liking to people much. They always stayed outside. Now my aunt's place was 200 acres. Anyway, it was a large place, and while my brother and cousin were there just watching TV or whatever, the dogs started whining outside. They had seven or eight of them. Now these dogs never came inside of the house, but they were scratching at the door wanting in. Then they heard what sounded like something scraping the window screen in the living room. This was in the summertime and the windows were open. That scared my cousin and brother enough to lock themselves in the bathroom, until our parents all came back from church a couple of hours later. My brother said he was in 10th grade at the time, and my cousin would have been in 7th. My brother said it sounded just like something was scraping its fingernails on the window screens. It would do it at one window for a bit then go to another window. He said whatever it was went around to all of the windows of the house and scratched on the screens. I thought about these things on and off that had happened to my brother, neighbors and cousins a lot through the years. 
and after putting two and two together after some things I have experienced as an adult, I look back to those weird events back home, and I now believe it was a Sasquatch that had done these strange things that took place. I used to work security at a major music venue. Part of your job in the pit is to scan the crowd and make sure no one is fighting, passing out, etc. One evening, just as the sun was going down and the opening act was on stage, I noticed two really strange dudes. The show playing pulled a crowd of mostly 16 to mid 20 year olds, a very young, energetic crowd. These guys were about a foot taller than everyone around them, looked like they were pushing 40, and were there to serve court papers. They both had the same suit on, in the middle of summer, at an outdoor music venue. They both had almost bald heads, like if you had shaved, but let it grow back for a week, and super pale skin, like almost actual white. They stood there completely motionless, off of stage left staring straight forward. I kept watching them, thinking maybe they were executives for the band or something, but honestly, they were freaking me out, and I had nothing better to do. After I stood there staring at them for maybe 5 minutes, it was like they noticed I was on to them. They both started staring directly at me, I could even feel their stares when I looked away. I approached another guard and asked him if he thought those dudes looked suspicious. He said, yeah, but I never trust a white guy in a suit, and blew me off. When I turned back to the two men, they were walking away and appeared to be in stride together, like moving in sync. They also had a weird stride, like almost rocking side to side. Well, later when I was taking a water break, I heard my supervisor talking about those two tall white guys in suits. I told her I noticed them too, and she went on about how creepy they were, and how they gave her the willies. She said she was about to approach them, but when she came back with some backup, they had left. For context, I'm British and live in England, and this story took place when I was 15 I'm now 24, but it has bugged me ever since it happened. This is a very short story, but one that has lingered in the back of my mind ever since it happened. I was playing video games on a Wednesday night, and there was a knock on the door at about 11 pm, which was out of the ordinary and in of itself a bit odd. My mum was the one who answered it, but since it was so late, I came out to see who it was myself. We have a square shaped spiral staircase with platforms as you go up each step, and there's a balcony at the top which I could look over. It was also dark so it would be hard to see me, especially from outside of the front door. When my mum opened the door, there were two men who she described as sounding German, wearing black suits. They were pasty white, tall, shaven, and quite bulky. They didn't say anything like why they were there, what they wanted, or who they were, just asking if I was home. What got me was that they didn't just go by my first name, but also by my last name Trofton, like the second doctor, which isn't very common. My mum, thankfully, said no, and told them they had the wrong house. My mum, after she had closed the door, told me that they were still outside looking at our windows. She told me to stay out of sight since she thought they were eyeing the house to see if I was home or not. After about 20 minutes they finally left the pavement, but my mum was convinced they'd be sat in their cars, still watching, so I hid a bit longer. It was really intimidating, especially considering I was 15, and had never done anything malicious. This was 9 years ago, and I've heard nothing since. I've always wondered who they were, what they wanted, or if it was even a malicious encounter. Nonetheless, it truly freaked me out. To clarify, I'm not certain they were German, that's just what my mum said their accent reminded her of. They were pretty quiet so I barely heard them myself, and only got a glance of them in the dark outside the door. Here are some theories. Harmless prank by a friend, calling some religious group to my house. Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, etc. I somehow ended up on a cults list. Deep Web could have led them to me somehow. I had to give an employee a ride home from work one day. Her ride bailed on her, 
and her parents were out of town, and she was 15. I wasn't leaving her outside at night to find her own way home, miles away, and I checked in with the owner of the company first to cover my butt. On the way to her house, we passed by what looked like a young blonde woman in a white hoodie, with large patches of red. I wasn't paying close attention, as the driver. The teenager asked me to stop, I said no way, and then glanced in the rear view mirror, and there was no girl there. It was a gated community, so unless she jumped a nine foot stone wall, I have no idea what we saw. But I will not drive through that neighborhood anymore. On other driving related incidents, I worked a job where I did a lot of driving, and passed through this small town. I caught a glimpse of someone on the side of the road, brunette, in a fancy prom, quinceanera and pageant looking dress huge skirt yellow, I assumed she was there for a photoshoot. Twelve hours later, on the way home, I passed through that same town, and was chilled to the bone to see a cross on the side of the road covered with artificial yellow flowers. That one's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. I know this might sound crazy, but when I was around 2 or 3 years old, around 2006 or 2007, my mom and I had just come home from my grandma's house after she got off work. We arrived home around 6.30 or 7 p.m. I know some say that you can't remember anything from a young age, and that my mom might just be influencing me to remember this, but I actually remember this very vividly. I saw another similar story posted on here, and it literally gave my mom and me goosebumps because of how similar it was. So here it goes. We walked into our house, and I went to play in my room, while my mom started to cook dinner. I remember I was just playing in my room, then I stepped out to start wandering around. When I looked into my father's gaming room weird, I know. I saw this goblin-like creature who looked just like the green goblin from the Spider-Man comic books. He was wearing a pointy purple hat, pointy purple shoes, and had pointy ears and a grin with sharp teeth. He stood about six or seven feet tall. When I saw him, I ran to my mom in the kitchen and started tugging on her to come with me. She immediately followed me and saw him as well. He had moved into our hallway and looked very confused or concerned, like he didn't know where he was. When he looked at us, he seemed surprised. He looked very inhumane, but he didn't instill fear in us. Instead, it was more of a calming presence. After he saw us, he ran back toward the gaming room and just disappeared. My mom went to check where he went, but he was nowhere to be found. Mind you, there were only two windows in that room, and they were blocked off by a desk and were closed while we were gone. Many have told me that this was just my dad playing a prank on us, but he was never around and isn't nearly as tall as the goblin we saw. We still talk about it to this day, telling the exact same story each time. I still can't get this creepy image out of my head, and I just wanted to come on here to get an explanation for this, or to see if anything similar has happened to anyone. Mind you, we lived in California in the Bay Area. Please let me know if you've had a similar experience because I want to know. I have attached an image very similar to what I saw. This wasn't really deep woods but it was far enough in the forest that there was no sound from the nearby neighborhood I live in. So my friend and I have been thinking about going into the woods and making a fort of sorts and spending the night out there one night after we were finished. So we would meet up outside the trail entrance on our bikes and would ride in with hatchets and flashlights and would spend most of the day out there and a bit of the night out there and we had finished the floor and decided to dig a fire pit so we could have that going and sit by the fire at night since it was winter and was cold. So we dug a hole, about a foot in the ground with a clear space two feet all the way around, for the fire and go ahead and get out of the woods. The next day we meet up like usual I have a bag of kindling while he has a lighter and we had cut some branches and cut them up into some nice reasonable sticks for a fire the night before and left them out there to dry with them being on a tree suspended above the ground. 
We go out to our fort and work on making one of the walls cutting the little trees around and cutting good branches and holding them together with rope. We continue all throughout the day and when it starts becoming dusk we go ahead and start making the fire. When we got it lit it was at that point of the day that it's dark enough you can barely see but still light enough you can still maneuver around without a flashlight so we keep working on the wall and when it becomes completely dark we meet up at the fire and sit for a bit just talking and enjoying the heat. I think okay well I'm gonna get up for a bit and go cut a log for us to sit on so we're not sitting so low and I start cutting the log I get three cuts in when we hear a howl instantly we're both pointing our lights in the direction of the howl and we saw a good four to five pair of eyes staring back at us from that kind of glare you see when you point a light in an animal's eyes. As it turns out we had attracted the attention from a pack of coyotes that live out in the forest and we were out of there as fast as we saw the eyes. Riding around the trails on our bikes as fast as our legs would push leaving our packs, my lantern, the lighter, and the hatchets. We made it to the neighborhood and kind of sat at the entrance of the trails for a bit, kind of soaking in what had just happened. We went back in about 30 minutes later to get our stuff and make sure the fire went out and wouldn't burn the forest down but we didn't stay for very long lol. I had one of those converted camper vans and was tripping around the South Island of New Zealand. The sun was setting so I had one eye out for a camping spot. Saw a huge hand painted sign that said camping. So turned off the road and into a gravel pit. There was a fresh water river, huge river rocks and beautiful trees everywhere. But what creeped me out was the number of vehicles parked in various states of decay. I'm not joking. 11 or 12 abandoned vehicles. Just rotting in the elements next to this river. And no people around. Behind the cars was a long empty paddock running up a hill towards what I immediately described as the house from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Paint flaking off the walls. One or two windows boarded up. A rickety old balcony and I'm pretty sure there was an old rocking chair there too. 2 plus 2 equals murder in my mind so I got the hell out of there. Drove for another 40 minutes after dark looking for a better spot. Ended up parking in the middle of a town. Didn't sleep a wink. This is kind of just an odd fishing story, but every summer, my family went camping on remote campsites that were typically islands in the middle of a lake, or a piece of the edge not accessible except from water. The body of water is quite big, and there are a lot of fish, but you mostly see trout and catfish for the area, nothing too big. Well, my best friend came with us this year and all the adults were drinking by the fire at dusk. It was getting darker, but the twilight illuminated the water enough to do some fishing still, so I cast off a rock with my friend by my side. I felt a bite and started to reel it in, and it was big. The biggest fish I have ever had online to date, I don't fish much, mostly for food, I was just barely able to pull the thing above the water line and we were hollering at this point for my parents to help, but they were busy drinking. The fish had to have been at least two feet long, my fishing pole was almost bent in half, and unfortunately as I was reeling it up, my line snapped from the weight of the fish. 60 pounds rated fishing wire. Flung it into the tree above me and I lost my lure. We freaked out and were yelling to my family about this huge fish. My dad said that there aren't any fish that big in the lake and there is no way. We were exaggerating how big it was. But even 10 years later, I brought it up and we both remember the exact same thing. A massively big fish that did not belong in that water, I still wonder what it was and how it got there. Not necessarily deep in the woods but while camping overnight me and the rest of my scout troop. Most of us around 15 or 16, 
arrived to our campsite to find a single man tent occupying one of the prime spots for putting up a tent. It was out of the way enough and it was kinda late so we decided we would let the dude who appeared to be asleep stay there until the morning. A few hours later however, my friends and I had a very uneasy feeling about the tent, we decided to try and wake the guy up. We could see the outline of his body as the tent was really small, so we started to lightly kick his feet. When this didn't work we started to yell and make noise and still, the man was motionless. Realizing the reality of the possible situation, we went and got my dad who grabbed another leader that was a doctor. They opened up tent and the doctor confirmed that the mystery man was dead. The cops came like three hours later and we had to guard the tent from the younger scouts, 11 to 12 years, as we didn't want them to know cause they would have freaked out. Super creepy sitting next to this dead body with the full moon shining down on the empty desert. I was with a couple buddies hiking some trails up by Helen GA. We decided to follow some game trails off of the main trail just to see what we could come across. Around an hour into the game trail we realized we should turn back but we had made so many loops and turns that we quickly ended up lost. We started just cutting back in the general direction of the main trail and we came across a clearing with a very run down and decaying cabin. Naturally being young and dumb males we decided to explore it. The front door was just hanging and fell off when we tried to open it. Parts of the floor would collapse as we walked through. There was an old nasty looking mattress that was covered in mold and mostly decayed. A bunch of dishes laying in random places and what appeared to be a very very old ham radio. In one of the rooms we found a completely decomposed skeleton of what we assume was a dog or coyote. After exploring for a bit we decided to hit the main trail before dark set in so we could set up camp and not get lost. Have been back about 5 times since then and can never seem to find the cabin again. I was hiking in the Wasatch Mountains in August back when I was a boy scout. It was a small adventure group within the troop. We got up to the top of Mount, Olympus, not Greece, right as the weather started to change. We were on bare rock a few hundred feet above the tree line when a thunderstorm started forming. The leader made us take our hats off and ruffle up our hair. We could smell static electricity in the air and everyone who had hair long enough to move in the wind had their hair stand on end from the static. We climbed slash hiked back down the mount as dry lightning started to strike the peak with our hats off until we couldn't smell the static, and our hair could lie flat on its own. A few years ago I went hiking in New Mexico with a small group of about eight. On the fourth day one of our crew members had to drop out because they were having problems with the heat. So we had to backtrack to the nearest ranger station and get them situated. As a result we were off schedule by about 2-3 to three hours. The next campsite was nearly 7 miles away and required the use of map and compass to navigate. There were no trails. We eventually got lost as the sun began to set and we decided to cut our losses and find a suitable spot to set up camp. Almost immediately we started hearing a bear growling near us. It was already too late to move as the sun had mostly disappeared. We opted to have two guys walk around the clearing and bang pots together in order to scare off the bears, while the rest of us set up the bear bags. Usually when setting up bear bags you string a rope between two trees and hoist up bags containing your smellables, food, chemicals, etc. Unfortunately our makeshift campsite was in an area of heavy deadfall. The ground was littered with dead slash rotting trees. So basically our bear bags were bad. Instead of 15 feet off the ground they were maybe 5. We basically skipped dinner because we weren't sure if we had enough water to cook, considering we were still lost and needed water for the next day. Predictably the bears did not leave us alone. At this point it was pretty clear there were at least two of them. 
They continued the circle our camp and growl at us, keeping far enough away to where we couldn't see them. Needless to say it was a stressful night, but we all managed to get some sleep. I woke up several times to hear a bear very close, but I couldn't see them from inside my tent. The next morning we found our bear bags remained untouched. We packed up camp and finally managed to figure out where we were. When we arrived at the next camp on our trip we indulged in our one packet of dehydrated biscuits and gravy. In the days before kids my husband and I used to go wild camping. The first time we went wild camping on Dartmoor, UK National Park, using an old map, we wandered onto a bog in bad weather. It took my husband, the navigator, about three hours to find us a way out. Everywhere we stepped out feet sank into the mud and water visibly pooled on the surface of the sodden ground. We were new to wild camping and didn't have the best gear at the time. A while later we stopped in a forested area and saw police tape everywhere so we moved on. The next day we stopped off in a small B&B, pub for a meal. The bar TV was playing Wimbledon but during a news break the forested area and boy from the day before were shown. Police had found the body of a guy, 18 or so, I think, who had been camping with friends and wandered alone onto the bog in the dark. Admittedly there was alcohol involved but I'd been quite anxious wandering around that boggy moor, and it brought home that without my husband I could have quite easily died on the moor. I love wild camping but have zero sense of direction and it's hard to describe to someone who hasn't experienced it how quickly the weather can change and go from clear to fog so thick you can't see anything. I spent over a week backpacking and camping in Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in Arizona, March of 1997. Optum is a harsh, but beautiful environment, and we had hauled all of our water in our backpacks and coordinate water resupplies. I've got to get to work here, so I'll keep this short, but we witnessed the Phoenix lights from the backcountry desert. Also, we stumbled across numerous discard piles from undocumented migrants crossing over from the Mexican border. Empty water containers, clothing, a stuffed animal, etc. Pretty heartbreaking seeing evidence of people gradually letting go of personal items in their arduous journey to a hopefully better life. Saw a bunch of other cool stuff there too, but nothing else strange or scary. Had a bad experience in Montana on some medication that affected my oxygen intake. Decided to go back on my own which entailed sleeping by myself a few nights which at 10,000 feet can be a little frightening in itself. On the last day hiking I was just exhausted. I wouldn't have been able to fend off an aggressive six-year-old. I then can across a freshly killed elk literally laying on the trail. This was a very large animal and two Europeans came across the scene exactly at the same time and just lost their minds and took off running. I was barely able to walk so I just hoped whatever killed that animal would leave me alone. I did made it back okay. Just this last October I was in Dolly Sods in West Virginia and somehow ended up getting turned around. I've been on at least 16 backpacking trips out west at much higher altitudes and have never gotten lost. It was long day around 15 miles with a full pack. To this day I have no idea how I ended up getting turned around. It was like an episode of the Twilight Zone. I started having thoughts that I wasn't in my reality anymore and that I would walk this trail for eternity. My brother and friend went out looking for me which I felt terrible about. I met a couple who had also been lost but had figured out where they were and I followed them out. I literally ended up going the opposite direction and to this day I have no idea how I could have been that clueless. It was a big deal and sent me into a deep depression. I'm actually fine now but I feel something strange happened in those mountains.
My friends and I were determined to make it to a certain spot before setting camp so we were out well beyond dark, which I don't recommend for anyone who isn't experienced. And even then what we were doing was probably dumb. There are three of us walking up this trail when all of sudden the guy in front says oh crap and we all freeze. Ahead of us in the dark is a pair of glowing eyes locked onto the three of us. The eyes lower while staring right at us. And it looked like a cougar getting ready to jump. We are in Eastern Oregon and cougars are in the area. We take a couple steps forward to see if we can get more light on it while grabbing some bear spray. Once we get a few steps forward we see it's just a deer that lowered its head to eat while still starting at us few. We head up to our spot, camp, go summit a peak and hike back down to our car the next day. In the same exact spot we saw that deer we found its carcass ripped to shreds and bloody. It had maybe been 12 hours since we were last there. We are all pretty sure that there was a cougar watching us that night, we just couldn't see it. Still messes with me sometimes when I'm out in the backcountry for a few days. I wasn't deep in the forest but my family has a cabin that we would visit often during the summer. I was an emphatic runner at the time and would run twice a day, once in the very early morning, before sunrise and I was out on this run, maybe 6 to 7 minutes away from the cabin, and I heard a loud howl from maybe 100 to 200 feet away from me. I froze instantly and looked in that direction, I couldn't see anything. But within 20 seconds I could hear the sounds of what I assume was multiple coyotes ripping into a dead deer or something. It was truly a horrifying sound that I wish I could unhear. I'm just glad I managed to quietly get back to the cabin and stay there. Ever since then I don't run without sunlight. This one still gives me chills. Me and my sister would take long trips into deep woods surrounding our secluded house. At a certain spot into the journey, a German shepherd without a collar would run out of nowhere and greet us. He was a full-grown dog and very friendly. He would follow us around for a bit and then continue on his way. Well one day we went out like any other day except our friend wasn't showing up. We didn't think too much of it until we found his body. It looked as though he was attacked by wolves with how ripped apart he was, but it doesn't look like the animal ate very much of my doggy friend at all, just sort of tore him up and left. Later we keep walking and talking about it, until we hear a very weird sound come from the distance. It sounded like what I can only describe as maybe a large animal moaning with a sense of maybe pain slash confusion. It was far off at first but when we heard it we stopped to listen. I couldn't hear leaves moving but I heard it again. This time noticeable closer. The sound of a wailing animal but it seemed more aggressive sounding this time. Then we hear it again but it's directly on the other side of the hill we're at. Bone chilling wail, almost like a dying woman. Me and my sister bolted out of there without even thinking about each other. Just sprint all the way back to a trail that would take us home. Sometimes I wish I stayed to see what it was, but nope I'm good with the outcome of living. A few of us were hiking around the Blue Nile Falls in Ethiopia. After a long day walking we make it along the valley, hot, sweaty and looking forward to feeling the cool air of the falls. We're hopping over rocks and making our way across the floodplain when a shepherd starts screaming at us to stop. I jump the gap between some large rocks and look down to see a snake pit as I jump. The diameter of the moving snake is that of a car wheel. Trying to backtrack with the biggest case of Elvis legs was the hardest part. We get back to our site and get out of the car just in time to see a car flying down the road out of the campsite. It was the two guys and their dog high tailing it. About three minutes later, a truck comes flying down the road going the same direction. 
We realize it was the guy from the camper slash owner of the dead dog. We decide we want nothing to do with whatever is about to go down so we stuff our tent into the car with the sleeping bag still inside and tent poles still together. We drive to the Walmart in Roswell. Roswell NM at night is a whole other thing in itself, but needless to say, we didn't really sleep that night. We pieced together that most likely we heard a dog fight that ended with the smaller dog dead and the owner extremely angry. The weird croaking noise was probably a bird, but who even knows? On a three-day river kayaking slash camping trip, one of our campsites was occupied when we arrived on the second night. It was a weird family of five that said their party boat bottomed out and they had been stuck there for days. These people had clothes on a drying line, pots full of fish guts sitting everywhere, and tons of food and trash everywhere. My group, trying to be polite, engaged in conversation with the husband. I wasn't the one talking to him, but suddenly it got quiet as the husband finished a punchline to a joke with the N-bomb. My whole group told him he needed to cut that thing out immediately. All of a sudden the entire family grabbed some of their stuff, boarded the bottomed out boat, and took off down river with no problem. They left behind all of their garbage, drying clothes, fish guts, and grandma's wheelchair and were never seen again. To this day my friends and I have no idea what the hell was going on that night. My husband and I were through hiking pictured rocks in the upper peninsula. On our first night, we couldn't find the individual campsite location, so we ended up just finding a random clearing and setting up camp there. Not long after we turned into sleep, we heard some male voices coming toward us. We listened as they got closer and closer until eventually they were standing outside our tent, speaking a language we were unfamiliar with and shining their flashlights at our tent. We were frozen with fear, thinking we were about to be attacked. As soon as my husband flicked his flashlight on, the men started to walk away. He got up to check it out, and didn't see any trace of them besides some trash they had dropped around our tent. I camped alone once in my life, though I have been in backcountry multi-day treks about three dozen times with other hikers. I set up camp in the forest only a couple miles in but I was camping illegally so I went pretty far off the trail. Night was coming and I got a nice cozy fire going as the woods darkened. Around 11 I heard noises purposeful, stalking noises in the undergrowth. I shone my headlamp out and saw at least three pairs of glowing eyes reflecting back. I know very well that coyotes almost never pick a fight with a grown woman. Yet they didn't budge when I yelled and threw rocks. The circles just bobbed along, watching. Freaked me out. I packed my tent and walked to the road and asked my friend to pick me up, I biked. I'll never do that thing again. I knew they would not attack, but being alone in the dark gives me such a primal fear of being eaten alive. I was wandering slash bushwhacking around some mountains in the Boise National Forest and came upon a weird abandoned campsite. There were a bunch of coke bottles, some bear bags, other miscellaneous trash. There was some irrigation piping rolled up under the bear bags. The creepiest part was a three inches tall figurine of a Catholic saint sitting above the sleeping area. I got a weird vibe so took a few pictures and got back to my car. A couple days later I went to a forest service office to report what I saw. Apparently in the last year or two there had been other similar sightings in the area. I had stumbled on part of a marijuana growing operation run by a Mexican cartel. I'm glad it was abandoned at the time. I can't imagine the people running a weed farm in the Idaho mountains would take kindly to strangers. Edit. 
stumbled onto an abandoned weed growing operation run by a Mexican cartel. Camping in New Mexico, in a state park somewhere outside of Roswell. My, now ex, husband and I took a road trip out to Arizona for our honeymoon. We had plans to stop in Roswell on the way back home and decided to camp at a site about half an hour outside of town. We pull up to the campsite at about 1 AM and as we're filling out the camp registration, another car pulls up. I watch a little closer as I was in the car waiting and see my ex greet the two other men. They chatted, he gets back in the car and tells me they were nice enough and I notice they have a dog in the car with them. We proceed to drive around the campsite in the dark looking for a spot to pitch our tent. There were a lot of campers taking up spaces and it was difficult to discern where we were allowed to set up, but eventually we settle on an area with only one other tent nearby. The other two guys drove off and had chosen a spot that looked to be more crowded, but we couldn't see them anymore from our sight. We groggily throw our tent up and crawl inside. As we're trying to sleep, we hear this strange, repetitive noise, sort of like a croak. We lay awake, and eventually start whispering to each other about the noise. We're freaked out, because we can hear whatever it is moving around but can't quite figure out what it could be. Then we hear snarling. I quickly looked at my ex and we quiet down to listen closer. It sounds like there is a serious animal fight of some sort going on elsewhere in the site. There's snarling, growling, and then loud yelping. Then we hear voices. First there's a wail, like nightmare level crap. Then men begin yelling at each other. We can hardly hear, but certainly nothing friendly is being said. Commence more crying and wailing. My ex and I look at each other and in our heads we think someone is being attacked by an animal or something. My ex had a carry permit and therefore, had his gun. I grabbed his arm and said we should make sure those people are okay. We hop in the car, adrenaline pumping, and start looking for where the noise was coming from. We eventually see lights from a camper and a car. The car belonged to the two guys from earlier. As we pull up, one guy is sitting in the car with the dog, as the other frantically tears their tent down. A man walks across the path of our car headlights and he's carrying a dead dog. I can hear a woman crying somewhere. My ex rolls up to the guy in the car who is visibly shaking and asks if they're okay. The guy can't even get out a real answer. I notice the guy carrying the dead dog turning his attention back to the two guys and I elbow my ex hard. Time to go. Chased by a wolf pack for a freaking long time, felt like an entire day, but wasn't more than two hours at most, through the Alps during slash and after nightfall. The terrain continuously switched from steep open areas to thickly wooded hangs. Inside the forest it was almost entirely dark. I stopped being able to see them and only heard their sounds of communication with another, growls, which I am sure, were meant for me whines, huffing, the movement of their bodies behind and beside me. It was the most terrifying thing, more so than when I had been able to see them before dark. I had no weapon aside from branches which I had to abandon occasionally to make it down the steep bits without falling to death. Injured my ankle trying to get across a stone pocketed stream and my backpack got stuck in some barbed wire a little later. I almost ripped the entire fence along with me. Only when I took a deep breath and collected my leftover chill it unhooked like it was nothing. Shortly after, the noises left all of a sudden, five minutes later I was standing on the nearest road and made my way to the village. Heart still beating frantically, I still wandering left and right, ears peaked like a rabbit at dawn. Tell you what, during this entire experience, 
I didn't think once about all the petty little problems and dramas I had been facing at that point in my life. I don't think I even thought at all. I acted purely on autopilot. Heal, I didn't even exist if that makes any sense. These furt animals taught me a whole load of respect and presence for my surroundings and experiences in life. I spoke with wildlife personnel the day after and was explained that the pack wasn't looking for a snack, but most likely trying to get me out of their territory. Fair enough, wolves. I get you. And thanks for not taking a bite out of this young, fool-headed lady who didn't weigh more than 51 kilograms at that point. Peas. I started this with one sentence and wanted to leave it at that. Now look at this novel. But there is one more part I want to share about that day. It sounds mad and I'm mindful of who I tell about this but since I feel anonymous on Reddit, I'm just gonna add it. I traveled a lot in my short lifespan and a shaman I got to know once gifted me a necklace holding a wolf tooth from one of the wolves he had raised. He didn't say much about it, only gave me a knowing smile. I've been wearing it for years before my experience in the Alps and it always kind of made me feel protected. Friends would always comment on my fingers playing with it absentmindedly. That day in the Alps, I crouched in front of a forest bit, back towards the trees, eyes overlooking the sundown in the valley before me. Mountains surrounding my view, their tips tinted in the softest shade of pink. I felt peace and freedom from my deepest core, when I found myself playing with the wolf dude around my neck and jokingly thought to myself I wonder why I haven't met any wolves yet on my travels. Five seconds later I heard a growl, so deep, so close behind me, I will never forget it. That's when I turned around and the rest of the story has been told already. Coincidence or not? Either way, one hell of an experience. I've got more of angry kangaroos and annoyed boars but those are for another day. Congratulations to anyone who actually read this killer of a story. I'm glad I got it all out but it's been going forever. Suddenly it's 2 AM. Howdy. I live on a ranch in western Idaho, and every June we move cows from our property to a place on the other side of Hit Mountain, and because we don't have the trailers to drive our cattle, and because it's summer, we just trail them through BLM land and some private property, with permission OFC. Last summer it was business as usual, bed rolls, teepees, and a few pack horses to haul that stuff. It's basically a long camping trip, a new place each night with the sound of cattle and days spent with too many hours in a saddle. First two days always suck, but you get used to it. Anyway, to the, ah, uh, interesting bit. Third night and I had second watch, to basically make sure that the cattle weren't getting too far from where we were camped. I'm about two hours in, 3 a.m. or so, when the cows nearest me boogered pretty bad and pushed the herd away from me. Obviously that's a bit of a problem so I went to check it out, as you do. When I tell you that whatever the hell that thing in the sagebrush was, it wasn't natural. It was like a person, except the arms were too long and the eyes were too big and the skin was stretched in ways that were just wrong. Most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. I backed towards where we made camp, and thank God the thing didn't follow, but it was definitely watching me. I woke up my stepdad and mom, who came out with a rifle to investigate. The thing was gone when we got over there but there were some really bizarre tracks around the sagebrush, and when we rounded the cows up the next morning two calves were missing, and there were more of the same bizarre tracks around our camp and where the horses were. Never found any traces of the calves, and I wouldn't take watch for the rest of the drive, for obvious reasons. I have nightmares about that still. Edit. Went on a cattle drive last June and one night I was on watch and saw some sorta of ungodly horror movie-esque creature and haven't slept right since. This may not be scary to a lot of you, 
but it was to me. After backpacking once, I can say there are some things you just can't know until you try it. It was my first time ever backpacking. I was in the Rockies in Colorado backpacking with my best friend and a small group of guys. We found our camping spot for the first night, a beautiful little aspen grove about 200 yards from a little pond, at the base of some 14 ers It was pretty late at night, I'd say around 11, 30 pm, and everyone was asleep except for me and my friend. We decided we should go get water from the pond about 200 yards or so away from our campsite and filter it so we can be ready to go the next day. The pond wasn't far, but you couldn't quite see it from our campsite since the trees covered our tents. We headed out with our headlamps in the pitch black to get some water from the pond. We take this very clear gravel path to the pond that we had walked back and forth down almost a dozen times the day before. We get to the pond and filter our water, and then head back to camp. As we are walking back, I turn my headlamp on, to be met with a pair of glowing green eyes about 50 feet away from me. My heart absolutely dropped into my stomach. Slowly, more and more huge green eyes appeared from the trees. There were as many as 20 pairs of eyes staring at us. When I tell you my fight or flight kicked in stronger than it ever has before, I mean it. I literally thought I was about to die. In hindsight, it was silly, just a bunch of deer, but I didn't know that at the time. We start to head back down the same path we took. We walk for 5, maybe 10 minutes, until we realize something isn't right. We've definitely gone too far. We turn around and walk back the other way, looking for our campsite. We cannot find it anywhere. We end up all the way back at the pond. So, we turn around, taking the same gravel path as before, this time really looking for our tents in the Aspen Grove. We still can't find them. At this point we start to panic, as we are unable to find camp, it's cold, and there are tons of unidentifiable green eyes staring at our souls from the trees. We start jogging, back and forth we go. We searched earnestly for about 30 minutes, which felt like hours. We knew tents didn't just disappear, but we swore we were on the same gravel path. We even looked for another gravel path going from the pond and we couldn't find one anywhere. We finally found our tents after about 30 minutes of absolute panic. While it may not seem scary, we were both pretty young and in a completely new element at the hands of mother nature. It was a terrifying experience to say the least. I've had some crazy animal encounters with bears and lions. Here's a good cat one. There is a recreation area just outside of Laramie, why called Vitavu, which is a beautiful forested area with large rock outcroppings well known to climbers. It's one of the few places in the country where local climbers regularly bring shotguns to the crag. In 2016, at one particular rock outcropping known as Reynolds Hill, which is a bit deeper into Vitavu and a longer hike from the nearest forest road, my then GF and I spent the day climbing and finished our last route as the sun set. As we gathered our things and hit the trail in the dark, I whistled for my dog but couldn't find him. I flashed my headlamp into the trees and saw a pair of eyes reflecting back at me, about 10 meters away in the trees. At first I thought it was my dog, until I realized those eyes are way too far apart to be my 60 pounds dog and the eyes were much too far above the ground. The distance between eyes implied a head that was massive. Just then my dog comes out of the same trees and joins us, oblivious to the fact he was just being stalked. I flipped my headlamp to the back of my head, to keep light shining on the cat. Cats tend to pounce when you have your back turned, for over a mile. This thing stalked us, never getting closer than 10 meters but it was big enough to be a damn scary hike out. Four years later, Sept 2020, my new girlfriend and I, 
with our two dogs are climbing in Vitavu. We meet and befriend a cool couple who have been camped out there climbing for a few months. I told them the story of being stalked coming out of Reynolds Hill, and a couple of days later all four of us find ourselves climbing at, yup, Reynolds Hill. After a late session finishing up on that same route from four years ago, we begin hiking out in the dark. It's such a deja vu feeling that as we come down off the rocks and onto the trial, I stop to retell the story, explaining to them hey guys, this is the exact spot where I flashed my light into the trees and saw the eyes. Literally as I'm recreating the story, I happen to flash my light and catch a pair of eyes reflecting back at us, about 15 meters out and up high on a cliff band. They think I'm messing with them, until the cat comes down and gets within 10 meters of us. We proceed to hike out in the dark, and the cat stalks us the entire way out. Near the trailhead, the trail winds through an aspen grove, and just before we entered it the cat comes within 5 meters. The previous cat was much bigger, but this cat got way too close. The other guy and I were hiking backwards, eyes and lights on the cat, knife in hand, while our girlfriends were huddled close but hiking forward. It was sketchy. Crazy how the same exact plot unfolded, at the same hill, after the same route. I like to imagine it was the original cat's offspring. A couple of days later my girlfriend actually saw a lion about 30 meters away, down in a small valley, in a full sprint chasing prey. No one else saw or heard it. I tend to ask all the climbers I interact with out there if they've seen any cats. Most of them haven't. But if you're keeping a watchful eye, you'll see them out there for sure. The locals know. That's why they carry shotguns. Edit. Deja Vu Mountain Lion Stockings at Night in Wyoming Mountain biking so not sure if this counts but here goes. I was mountain biking deep in the desert in New Mexico. Terrain was high desert mountain foothills. Think juniper, sand, rocks, grasses, cacti, and lots of hills. Notice something shiny and flashing periodically, glinting in the sun, at the top of a hill. Decided to stash my bike to the side of the trail and hike up this hill to check it out. When I get to the top, I find a shiny, mylar looking weather balloon thing slung over a juniper branch and dangling about a foot above the ground. A massive rattlesnake is laying below the mylar balloon, hissing and lunging and biting at it periodically causing it to swing around. The thrashing swinging motion of the mylar was catching the sun and was causing the glinting that I originally saw. I nope out of there and start traversing back down the hill. On my way down, I notice what looks like a grey gravel platform built into the side of the hill just a few hundred meters across from where I was coming down. I traverse over to check it out. Mind you there are no roads, trails, steps or other indications that any human or machine has access to this man-made looking platform. As I approach this pile of gravel with a flat top built into the side of this hill, I see a sign with more warnings on it than I have ever seen on one sign before. I'm going off of memory here, but the warning sign included, poisonous gases, nuclear hazard, trespassing, toxic substances, landslides, pooling water, and open shaft. Being a dumb teenager, this was like 15 years ago, I'm intrigued and decide to check it out. I scramble up to the flat top portion of the platform and I see an open hole in the ground leading straight down further than the eye can see. This opening is squarish, about 5 feet wide, 5 feet long, with rounded corners and seemingly infinitely deep. Being the aspiring explorer slash scientist I was as a 15 slash 16 yo, I decided the best way to see how deep it was would be to pick up a large rock and chuck it into the hole. So, I pick up a rock and drop it in. Nothing. 
Probably not that deep and the rock just landed in some soft sand a few feet down without making a noise. To be sure, I grab another large rock and this time, instead of dropping it in, I chuck it straight down as hard as I can. Wait a few more seconds I finally hear a very satisfying thud. Okay, it's really deep. I'm getting out of here. Then, as I start walking down, I hear a second massive thunk. Oh crap, that first thud was the first rock, and I'm only now hearing that second one. This thing must be crazy deep. Like a mile deep or something. I sprint down to my bike, jump on it, and bike away as quickly as I can. Funny thing is I went out there a year or so later, and could never find that shaft again. I think it must have been really well concealed from the trail BC I was looking for it and basically knew where to look, and still never found it. I am a wildlife biologist, and one of my duties is monitoring owls in the middle of the night. To do this, you have to walk along trails in the dead of night, sometimes I'm out until 2 to 3 am, stop periodically to play owl calls and listen for them to respond. Usually this is done with a partner, but I work for a chronically underfunded state agency, so I do the surveys alone. I do my surveys in redwood forests pretty far from civilization, so the forest is silent and pitch black. Sometimes the trees creak and moan, which is scariest, f but honestly the scariest part of my job is humans. Lots of creepy stuff happens when I do owl surveys, but the thing creepiest was definitely not in the deep woods. I was hiking down a defunct branch of a well-used trail at about midnight. The trail was cut into a steep slope and there was a wide river on the other side that the trail followed for about a mile until it joined with the main trail. I was about three stations into my survey and stopped for my next station. The owl calls are on a pre-recorded tape played fairly loud, and at one point there's an ear-splitting shriek that I always plug my ears for. So I plug my ears in and when I remove my hands I hear the tail end of a scream from the other side of the river not an owl, not a rabbit, not a fox, nothing I have ever heard before. I literally stopped breathing, and after the scream, a man shouts, Kind of a moaning shout like maybe pain or what I don't know. Maybe this is the wrong thing to do, but I packed up my wildlife collar and ran TF out of there. Never finished the survey reported it to use W's as survey interrupted by human activity and next time just called that area from my truck on the main trail with the volume cranked up. A black bear got within six feet of my tent during a seventh grade camping trip. One time when I was younger, about seventh grade, I went on a camping trip with a close family friend as a part of his birthday. In total there were five kids, all in the same grade, and two adults, the birthday boy's dad and his uncles. It was going to be like a boy's weekend. Once we get to the campsite we set up two tents, one large tent for all the kids to stay in, and a medium-sized tent for his dad and uncle. The first day was great, we did a bunch of activities like wood carving, canoeing, etc., and at night his dad cooked up some burgers for everyone. And then we all went to bed, not really thinking about what the ranger said about leftovers on our way into the campground. Suddenly at I would say around 2, 0 AM I wake up because I felt a large figure rub against my body from the outside of the tent, it sort of just walked by and after it woke me up, at first I didn't really think anything of it and was planning to go back to sleep, that is until I started hearing noises like something was looking through our stuff around the campfire. Now, before the adults went to sleep they told us not to open the tent under any circumstances, but there was a little window near the top of the tent that you could look through if you opened a flap, so I decided to take a look assuming that it was probably just a couple raccoons, since we did see some on the drive into the campground, but no, to my surprise it was something much bigger than a raccoon, there was a black bear eating the leftovers in the cooler. 
This was happening directly outside of my tent, like at max six feet away. So I was already pretty spooked, because I didn't know what to do in this situation. I wanted to wake up the other boys to tell them what is going on, but I knew if we started making too much noise that would be a really bad idea. So instead I just quietly stared at this bear as it ate all of our leftovers for a good 20 minutes. This was already not a fun situation, but while this is happening, I decided to start scanning the forest behind the bear, which is when I noticed there are a few pairs of bright yellow eyes staring at the bear maybe 15 feet further out. So at this point, I was crapping bricks, and decided to just close the window go back to sleep and pray that nothing happened. Like I said before, about 20 minutes later I finally stopped hearing the bear looking through all of our stuff. I take another peek outside the window, and sure enough, it is gone. The next morning we leave the tent to find a bunch of bear prints all over our campsite, with a large portion of our food having been eaten. There were also a bunch of smaller prints all over our campsite. We assume something else came by after the bear left. In the end, the dad decided to end the camping trip early, and we went back to the city later that same day. There was one time when me and my entire mom's side of the family were camping out of our state in Missouri. Me, my cousins named Keaton, Gabby, Eli, and a friend of mine I brought with me named Trinity and her boyfriend named Kendon. There was a part of the lake there that no one was supposed to go around because there were supposedly snakes and other dangerous wild animals. BTW this was night time. We each separated into groups of two. One of my other cousins was supposed to go with us but decided not to because he felt a little nauseous and didn't feel good. Anyway I go with Eli without flashlight and set out east into the part of the forest we aren't supposed to explore while the others go separate ways. About 20 or so minutes of straight walking we smell something horrible, like rotten meat set out for weeks. I ask Eli if he knows anything about bad smells and whatever and he didn't know anything about it. We slowly approach the smell and we see some sort of liquid trail leading to our campsite. Me and him walk towards the start of the trail and see a grown female and a baby rotting away, covered in blood each having stab wounds in the neck and stomach. Me and Eli literally screamed like little girls, we were 15 and 16 at the time, and screamed help at the top of our lungs for help. I smell something else though and Eli didn't notice it, but I did. I smelt my cousin's cologne near the bodies and boot prints that represent the bottom of my cousins. I didn't know what so I yelled at Eli to follow the trail and go back to camp and yell and scream for help while I stayed back and searched the woman to see if she had any eyed, personal information act to show the police if they arrived, I found her wallet and a credit card along with some notes for her work with her work name on it. I gathered these things and sprinted my ass off to get back to camp and tell everyone. I was brutally terrified and scared for my life I thought I was going to die that night. Anyways me and Eli get there trying to call down while Keaton and Gabby are back but the rest are still gone. I told my aunt, two uncles, grandpa and everyone else there. My uncle and dad went to check out the bodies while my aunt and everyone else called the police and ambulances and all of that. The cousin that was feeling sick smelt like manure and his boots looked wet. The police got there and handles everything and the ambulances took the bodies and all of that. My cousin is a good liar and I talked to him about it feeling scared trying to find ways to figure out if he did it or not. Still to this day I can't figure out if he was the one who murdered that innocent mom and baby. I don't know if the police caught anyone or found further suspects but they didn't talk to my cousin. I'm scared to this day to be around him at family reunions. A few winters ago some friends and I went on a road trip in West Virginia. We decided to camp on top of Hawksbill Mountain even though the shelter there is off limits for overnight campers. They even cemented the fireplace to discourage people. The night started off well enough and the stars made for some decent long exposures. 
Eventually the wind and cold made us all head back to the shelter and get ready to sleep. I don't remember if we were still awake or awoken by the noise. The noise was like nothing I have ever heard before and have a hard time describing since it has been so long. The best comparison I can think of is Native American throat singing or a didgeridoo mixed with some sort of beat like drums. It was very rhythmic and very terrifying. If you've ever been to the top of Hawksbill you know there is a semi-large cliff directly in front of the shelter and behind is all trees. The noise was coming from over the cliff, seemingly in the valley where no hikers would be, and regardless it was past midnight and pitch black. It's hard to explain but the noise was terrifying, it was haunting and really chilled your bones. Half the group wanted to leave everything behind and sprint the maybe one mile trail back to the car. The other half didn't want to leave, and I think we were all too scared to move. It lasted for hours, I fell asleep after probably two to three hours of this. Nothing strange happened in the morning but we were all haunted by it. It is still the scariest thing I have ever experienced camping and I am extremely suspect of the supernatural but this changed my mind a bit. Reflecting on it now it is easy to dismiss the experience but I remember being truly terrified of whatever was making that noise. I don't think it could have been the wind as once it started it never stopped and as I said it was rhythmic like a song, like something playing an instrument from another world. Since then I've gone back to Hawksbill once overnight, but nothing happened. I don't know what really happened that night. I'm curious if some others have camped Hawksbill and experienced a similar event. I was walking late at night on a trail when we kept hearing footsteps behind us faintly. My friend is a paranoid little bitch and kept saying dude there's someone following us. I didn't believe him. Eventually we were standing next to some brush and behind it we hear human footsteps. If you've ever been in a situation like this you know, for a fact that it's not an animal. You can hear the two legs rhythmically walking. Plus an animal most likely at the presence of humans would either stand completely still or just run away. This sounded straight up like a man walking towards us from the woods. Say what you want but we knew it was. We turned around and booked it and ran as fast as we could until we were on a road. On the way back to make things more adrenaline rushed we heard more footsteps in the woods behind us. I thought we were literally about to have to fight off a homeless dude in the woods, but I turned around and shined my flashlight to where I heard the sound and see probably four pairs of glowing eyes staring at us. They were coyotes. We could hear even more in front and some circling around us. From the sounds of them walking in the eyes I could see we think there was at least seven or eight of them. I had never been in a situation with wildlife like that before but it seemed like they were stalking us. Friend was a hunter and I asked him and he confirmed and said they definitely were, we did the whole assert your dominance and stay aggressive while maintaining eye contact thing and just walked away. They followed us for a bit but eventually ran off. As soon as we knew we were in the clear we ran all the way to the campsite. I was 15 at the time so we immediately woke my mom up and told her. It was scary as hell to think that all it would have taken was one of those coyotes to pounce and the rest would probably follow. Also it was the one walk in the entire day I didn't bring my knife. Although it was scary we had a cool story to tell everyone when we got back. Hey guys there was a dude following us in the woods in the middle of the night and then we got stalked by coyotes. Edit. Freaky human following us in the woods then coyotes stalked us when we were in the process of running back to the campsite. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.